what value my education had for me because I was I was a little bit bitter towards the system when I realized that I'm only making 40 grand a year as a structural engineer and I'm working 60 hours a week with two two weeks paid vacation. This is not what I signed up for. This is not a good lifestyle. And I was I was bitter about that for a while. And so education is one thing that I would I would harp on a little bit as as one of my losses. <music> Welcome back to the Millionaire Series. My name is Joe Moffitt with Master Life by Design, and I am super excited for our next guest, Jaden Olson. He is in the Utah area. And Jaden, thank you for being on the show today. Thanks for having me, Joe. Appreciate it. You got it, man. Well, I'm always excited to hear everyone's background because I think it's important to know where people come from. Sometimes people get this perception when talking about financial freedom and, and success and becoming a millionaire and beyond that it's like it's handed down to them. And that's not always the case, especially on this show. And we want to be able to kind of find out what's your background. Like after you graduated high school, where were you and how did you get to where you are today? And then we'll go from there. Yeah, well, I might even take it a little bit back before I graduated high school. I grew up in a family. We we did construction. My dad was a contractor. We we did live-in flips for years. I don't know that my parents would call themselves real estate investors in the conventional sense, but I moved 16 times before I turned 16. We were just built, moving in, remodeling, improving, and then moving into the next place. And it was it was a whirlwind. But I uh, I learned a wow. lot of skills. My dad. I worked with my dad in the construction industry. I became a licensed apprentice electrician at the age of 16 and worked in that field for a long time. Um, well, I shouldn't say a long time, but uh, anyway, in 2008, 2009, I was working as an electrician, making about $25 an hour and uh, construction just stopped. Like there was no work to be found. I couldn't find a job. I was headed in the direction to take over my dad's business, really enjoyed what I did. And uh, decided that I was going to go back to school and become an engineer. Um, so I, I went back to college. This was that was about the time that I graduated high school. Um, couldn't find a job, making twenty five an hour. Went back to school to get a master's degree in structural engineering. I chose engineering because I was always really good at math and logic, and uh, I liked the hands on idea of being able to build a structure and uh, still be a part of the construction space but on the design end. So that's why I went into structural engineering. In 2015, I graduated with my master's degree um, and I started work in Salt Lake City making $41,600 a year, which is about $21 an hour. <laughs> yeah, so, baby. <laughs> I was Racking great, up to financial Great freedom. step forward from what I was doing in, as an electrician. Uh, five, six Did you have years. debt from your master's? I didn't have debt. I was fortunate. I had some scholarships and I had some other things that helped me pay okay. for my master's degree. So I graduated debt-free, uh, but I was married at the time. We had a kid and uh, just starting out work. I mean, I was working 60 hours a week, making like two weeks of paid vacation, making that kind of salary. And I was just dead on my feet. You know what I mean? And I realized very quickly that this is not the lifestyle that I signed up for, which is a huge gap, I think, in our education system is helping people understand what kind of lifestyle they're signing up for when they go to school and get a degree, right? Um, yeah, I'll say that I love that you are aware of that. And I know you understand that now, but so many people don't understand the game that nowadays it's about people want freedom. They want their lifestyle. And right. in fact, I was on a call with a client today and he was talking about his 2023 goals. And I said, it's not about your goals. It's about the lifestyle you want at the end of 2023. What is the lifestyle? Right. So yeah, that doesn't sound about creating uh, too, the life uh, too you fun. want, right? <laughs> That's right. Life by yeah. design, baby. So all right, go for it. Yeah. So that was 2015, 2016, middle of the uh, 2016 presidential elections. I, uh, I've i always been a concerned citizen. I was doing my due diligence, re researching these uh, uh, candidates for president. And I started reading some of Donald Trump's literature that he's written and came across one that he co-authored with uh, Robert Kiyosaki. And uh, I started reading more Robert Kiyosaki's stuff, Red Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I was like, Holy smokes, the light went off in my head. It's like, I have to find this passive income. I have to find more assets that are going to pay for my lifestyle. And uh, from there, I was just hooked, like hard. Can you tell people who have not read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, what that's about? And what was your biggest takeaway? Your aha? 
Yeah, so Rich Dad Poor Dad is a book written by Robert Kiyosaki. Some people say it's fiction, which I don't really care. It's a great story, and it helps you understand about the lessons between liabilities and assets and how to define those in your financial uh, education. And and that's the bottom line is that you, you, in this world that we live in, you have to be financially educated. You have to understand where you're putting your money and you have to be able to make money while you sleep. And the only way to do that is by putting money into productive assets. He talks a lot about owning businesses and buying real estate. And then in his later books, he talks a lot more about buying gold and silver and cryptocurrency. So I kind of follow, I consider myself a avid student and reader of Robert Kiyosaki's material, but that's kind of the background of the book. Awesome. And what was your biggest takeaway from that book that was like your aha moment? Yeah, my biggest takeaway was the definition of an asset versus a liability. An asset puts money in your pocket and a liability takes money out of your pocket. And that was a, that was when lights really started going off in my head. Like my house is not an asset. Um, and I, I had a hard time understanding that because when I read that book, we were in a market where the only way, like the most, I was making more money in my house at the time than I was at, at my job as a structural engineer, just because the annual appreciation we were seeing in the Salt Lake Valley. Like that was mm. something that I had a really hard time understanding is that my house is not an asset. Because if I put the money into say another real estate asset or diversified my investments across other avenues, I would have made a lot more money had I had I not been tied up into my own property, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, that's great. Okay. So you get you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you understand assets, liabilities, a light bulb goes off and you got your master's degree, then what? Well, I said to my wife, I'm quitting my job. I'm going to be a full-time real estate investor. And she's like, no, you're not. We have a kid at home. <laughs> You've got responsibilities. And I was like, okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I had to, she reeled me back down into reality. And I decided that I was going to uh, work towards becoming a full-time real estate investor while working full-time as a structural engineer. So for the next four years, I went on to get my professional engineering license, which takes three years of experience in the field. I uh, quit that job that I was at to take a lower paying job, actually, that only required me to work four days a week and gave me one day a week of free time to pursue my real estate investing goals. Um, and that was a big step for me. I had to have an outlined framework of what I was going to do in my free time, how I was going to accomplish my goal of becoming a real estate investor. And then I took action and started writing offers, started like I read a lot more books and you can see a lot of these books up here on my bookshelf right here, wherever. <laughs> Um, nice. And but, so on that Friday, that Friday off that you've had that you were starting to spend time in your real estate investing and learning and, and writing offers, what did you, where did you start? Did you start with commercial, residential, single family, multifamily? where did you start? Yeah. Well, in all of the books and podcasts that I read and listened to, I learned very quickly that it doesn't matter where you start in real estate. It just matters that you dial in and focus on one thing and try to get really good at doing that one thing. And so when I started, I started writing offers on multifamily real estate, off market, on market. I, I was following up with brokers. I had some phone calls that I had to make. I was pulling lists from the county records off of a, a software that I had called Reonomy, list source, other owners of multifamily real estate. I just started calling them. I started sending them letters. I started um writing offers on these off-market properties. And before too long, I met a seller in Ogden, Utah, who had a sixplex that he was ready to sell. Wanted like He was fine to sell it off-market. He was motivated to sell quickly. He and his wife were going to serve a mission in Germany. And he's like, I can't manage this thing from halfway across the world. Um, excuse me. And so I said, well, would you consider seller financing it to me? He's like, well, what's that? Well, it's like, I give you monthly money, mailbox money. And in turn, you give me the title. And he's like, well, that would be really interesting. And so I wrote him three offers. We ended up negotiating for about a month and a half, went under contract on the property. Um, and I closed that deal with meth remediation that needed to be done, which was terrifying. Um, I had no cash flow because I knew that the rents were low and I knew that there was lots of room for improvement. And I knew that I was going to be doing all the work myself. So the cash flow wasn't that critical for me at the time. Um, but the best part about that deal is that I, I structured that deal to acquire it for 2% down, which was $10,000 out of my pocket to buy my first sixplex in Ogden, Utah. So commercial real estate is where I focused and that's where I got started. Wow. For you guys that are listening, 
most people nowadays, even with the, you know, the three and a half percent down as a first time home buyer and some of these other programs out there, you're spending more than $10,000 to get into a home. Um, and, Even like your primary residence, most people. Yes, that's yes, exactly. Yeah. And so he's doing this on a sixplex that could cash flow. Um, tell tell the audience why did you create three offers? What is the advantage of doing that? Why would you do something like that versus you're just bringing one great offer to this individual? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I'm a big fan of presenting. Uh, a seller, a potential seller with lots of offers, if for no other reason than it lets them know that I am a problem solver. I'm not out to get them. I'm not trying to lowball them. I'm just trying to get to a solution that works for both parties. And so in my three offers, I had one that was a full cash offer, meaning that I'd bring in a hard money lender and I knew that I could get the deal to work. And I end, that one was like $425,000 for these six units in Ogden. Um, he wanted 500,000 is what he he asked for. And I said, all right, 425 is the best I can do paying cash and 12% interest and hard money, yada, yada. Um, and I knew that I would have to get my some cash flow on that to pay my hard money and lots of value add opportunity in order to get long-term financing on the back end. So that was offer number one. Offer number two was, all right, what if I borrowed money from a good friend and we partnered on this? How much do you think that I could feasibly bring to the table on a seller finance deal. And I said, all right, I can probably bring 10 to 15% down. So my offer was $60,000 down and I would give you the full purchase price if you'll seller finance the rest of it. And so that was appealing to him. Um, and then my third offer was one that said, hey, if I can tackle this deal on my own, like I've got like $10,000 that I'm going to borrow from my home equity line of credit. What could I offer him to structure this deal to entice him to take this offer. And so I offered him $525,000, which was above his asking price. I said, I need interest only financing. I need a five-year balloon and I need to be less than 5% interest. And I need you to accept a 2% down payment. And so I said, here's a, good, here's a good accountant, talk to your accountant, figure out which one's going to help you avoid the highest tax, uh, avoid the most taxes. And, uh, we moved forward with the one that was giving him the, mo the highest purchase price. I was still paying him 2,400 bucks a month, which was about what he was taking home from the property management company at the time anyway. And he was able to wash his hands, walk away and go serve his mission in Germany with his wife and not have to worry about the property anymore. And so I, I really like that. Yeah. That's awesome. And for those that don't understand, he said a five-year balloon, it's not a physical balloon. It, it, it's, a, <laughs> it's a point where at the end of the five years, the note is called due. And so at that, it hasn't been five years since you purchased it? Yeah, we ended up selling that in 2021. Yep. Okay. So to explain to people, what are their options once the balloon comes to? So you're using creative financing with the seller, the seller's financing the deal. You got these awesome terms. You gave him more than he wanted. So you could get a lower down payment. So yeah. what are your options when that balloon is called due? Yeah. So the goal for this property, I, I had three goals in mind. I knew that the property was under rented. I knew that there was room for improvement. And so the whole goal with the balloon is to either figure out how to refinance into long-term money in that first five years, or you can sell it, or you can just say, like, I, I structured the contract or the note that it was deed in lieu of foreclosure. So frankly, after five years, I could just walk away and he takes over the property again. Um, but where the market was in this last year, we decided that selling was going to be our best option. And so we, we sold that thing and cleared $330,000 in that less than three and a half years that we had it. Wow. So over $330,000 profit, that's over a hundred K a year almost that you guys had just for holding it for three years. That's yeah. unbelievable. How many people watching could use an extra 300 K, 300 plus thousand dollars, right? It's like, yeah. no one's going to turn that down. Yeah. Um, but here's what's great here for those that are new watching and like, they're like, wow, I like to sell our financing, creative financing option, which now where we are at the end of 2022, it's like, that is one of the greatest strategies that we could be using, utilizing right now. But, um, you had to put the work in, you had to study, you had to educate, you had to actually go out and do the work, right? Take the massive action. And so here's my question well, I think to you. 
I think it's important ahead. that people understand how much massive work actually goes into that. I called over 3,000 people before landing that deal. And that was my first real estate deal. And wow. so, I mean, it, it is a ton of work. Absolutely. Yeah. And so it's not like you scrut, you take, you get a list and all of a sudden it's like you call five or 10 people and you get your first deal, right? It's like, you have to go through to work. So here's my question to you. Did you, how did, which avenue helped you learn more by reading all those books behind you or by actually getting out there and doing it? Uh, That's a really good question. I would, I would answer that and say that the books taught me the how to and the experience taught me the like how to get good, if that makes sense. Like it takes experience to get good at what you want to do, but you do kind of have to have a blueprint that you're following. Yeah. 3000 calls worth to get good. Right. And so, so those 3000 calls yielded $330,000. Most people are not willing to put in that work. What they want to see is your success. They want to see the nice house, the nice cars, but they don't want to do the things you have to do. It's cool to drive in them, but when you're sitting behind your desk and you right all day, every day, trying to talk to sellers and find out what are their needs, how can we make this a win-win? And not everyone's receptive to that. Have you ever had some bad experiences where people were just like, F off, leave me alone? Oh. How'd you get my number? Oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> And frankly, it hasn't gotten easier. Like I started cold calling in 2016 and it has not gotten easier. Like there's so many more people out there calling. So many more owners are being petitioned on a. Like I talked to an owner last week. He says he gets 50 calls a week on his property. He's like, wow, that is awesome. (laughs) (laughs) It's unreal. Like there's so here's a lot more people out there cold calling. Yeah. You got people out there, they're they're interested in cold, uh, you know, not cold calling, maybe seller finance options, creative financing, yeah. and they're going to they're gonna get out there, they're gonna start making these calls, getting lists, making calls. What do you what advice do you have for them that helps you, them stand out amongst the other 50 callers? What do you do to stand out? That is a really good question. And I think if I had the right answer for that, I would be a lot more successful than I currently am. Um, I think that it's all a relationship game, right? I mean, when you enter a seller financing contract, you have to understand that you are becoming a like a partner with the seller. The seller is signing an agreement. to They, they believe you're going to perform on that note. You're, you're making promises that you can fulfill. And so being the type of individual that can convey your ability to perform on promises that you make is number one, right? So it comes down to building that relationship. It comes down to having a reputation as an honest, integrable individual and being the type of person who's going to follow through on their commitments. And I mean, as, as we talk more about seller financing, Joe, I mean, I can't tell you how important it is to have that good relationship. Yeah. yeah. Why would why would a seller actually agree to terms such as you did? Why would they do that, right? Why wouldn't they just put it on the market with an agent and allow the agent to sell it for them and get all that money in a lump sum? Well, that we're in a very unique time. And I think it's a great question to ask, particularly at this time in the market when people are wanting to tap into the equity that they had six months ago. And they're realizing after listing their property on the market that they don't actually have that kind of equity. You can still get them that kind of money. You just have to convince them that they can't get it right now and they're going to have to take it over the next 10 years. And people will take that deal all day long. Like I've got a property right now that I'm trying to sell where I am offering seller financing because otherwise I'm going to lose money. If I sell at the discounted rate that the market's offering me right now, I'm going to lose quite a bit of money. And if I if I can offer a seller finance deal and recapture that loss over the next 10, 15, 20 years, 100% I'd rather do that than take a loss today. Um, but there's also That's tax awesome. advantages. There's also like continued cash flow, mailbox money, like true mailbox money. When people start realizing that a seller can hold a piece of paper and get money in their mailbox every single month, that's got some real appeal, especially burnt out landlords, people that are tired of changing toilets, you know, whatever it is. There's a lot of appeals. Yeah. Yeah, I think for someone new listening to this, if you're jumping in uh, as a beginner, there's so many different ways to do this. And 
that you have so much potential to create passive income that can literally change your life and and allow you to ha- maybe you're not dealing with tenants and whatnot. Maybe you outsource that to a property manager, but you literally could create passive income just by being able to get good at a skill set, like calling people, as you said, Jaden, building that relationship, being creative on helping a seller be able to figure out like, how do I maximize this deal for me and make it a win for you, right? right. And so you're trying to make these a win-win. How many, let me ask you this, how many deals do you have in the pipeline right now, if any at all, with the creative um, financing? Four or five that we're actively working on. Um, I actually just backed out of one. It was it was an incredible deal. It was nine cabins in Alaska. They were short-term rentals. Uh, the seller needed to sell. He was willing to carry 50% of the purchase price for 30 years um, at three and a half percent interest, which was just phenomenal. I mean, you can't beat those interest rates right now. I had to bring 50% of the down payment, which ended up being like four or five hundred thousand um, dollars. On on paper, the numbers looked fantastic. The reason that I ended up backing out is because the seller was extremely difficult to get a hold of. He was like, he wouldn't return my calls. He wouldn't respond to my text messages or emails. Um, I talked to people who had relationships with the seller, like the current property manager, and they said he's very difficult to work with. And so I started digging into this guy's reputation. And ultimately, I decided that I didn't want that type of individual to have a note over my head for half a million dollars and that he could cause problems with. And so ultimately, as good as that deal looked on paper, I didn't feel good about him being in a partnership with him, frankly. And so we're, mm-hmm. we're still pursuing a lot of deals. Uh, we're moving a little bit more towards development and entitlement right now. So that's the majority of our seller finance deals, um, but also syndication, short-term rentals, all that kind of stuff. That's yeah. awesome. So if so, if you could, would you be open to sharing what your portfolio is comprised of right now? I know there's a lot of different moving parts, but yeah, uh, where's your portfolio? So I ended up selling a bunch of my rentals in 2021. Um, there's a lot of different reasons for that. I started looking like if I'm buying multifamily long-term holds right now, my target is larger than 40 units. And so I'm writing offers on 40 units or larger, lar- looking to syndicate a lot of those deals. Um, I own 10 cabins in Alaska currently that are all short-term rentals. I've got a, a 32 acre, or 32 lot development in Northern Utah that I'm putting homes on right now that we're working on. I've got a $2 million home in Salt Lake that we're trying to get off the books. This is a flip that's taken me almost two years to get rid of and through. And the last two years have just been a nightmare to be flipping in with costs and now the market and everything. So that one, I'm trying to liquidate that one. Um, trying to think what else. Looking at, yeah, we've got some contracts that we're negotiating. There's a one and a half acre, either storage or a multifamily facility in North Salt Lake. That one's interesting because it's currently county land, but at the city council meeting last month, they annexed this por- this parcel into the city and gave the owners or interested parties the ability to essentially pick their zoning. And so I'm under contract on that one contingent on me picking the zoning and getting it approved. And so it's, it's a super exciting deal. Um, But yeah. So land development and and development that takes a while that takes years. It can, where flipping can happen. It can. Right. And then flipping for the audience that's new flipping can happen, you know, depending on what needs to be done. It could take years (laughs) as you alluded to, or it could take a few months, but as of right now, out of all of your portfolio, do you have a, is, do you have, what's your cash flow that comes in each month or are you mainly heavy on the development? You know, monthly cash flow right now is not mainly from my real estate portfolio. I have, I own a couple other businesses. That's where my cash flow is mainly coming from. Um, but I do have large income every year that we make in our real estate portfolio. Um, increased my net worth by $60,000 two months ago on buying this Alaska property. We syndicated that one and I ended up with 20% ownership in that one. Or sorry, 10% ownership to me specifically, 20% for the general partnership. Um, we're looking to make two to two and a half million dollars on this development deal that we're going to have sold by middle of next year. Um, wow. So there is some big checks coming in, but I don't have any like mailbox money <clears throat> in my real estate portfolio right now. 
Got it. Yeah, you sold all your rentals, you said. Yep. So you're getting some big development deals that will be kind of coming to an end, couple million dollars. How many of you out there could use a couple million dollars, you know, as one paycheck, right? So Absolutely. I love to hear that. Um, yep. Tell us, when, what year did you start your real estate journey? What year was that? Uh, I consider that I started my real estate journey in 2016 when I really started learning about real estate. And where that's when was my mindset network? shifted. What's that? Sweet. From Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which is awesome. Yeah. What was your net worth at that time? Oh, uh, pretty much zero. I mean, I probably had $20,000 equity in my home. It's probably about what I had. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I was negative 40,000. That was awesome. Yeah. Um, so fast forward six years yeah. with your business you or your businesses, your real estate portfolio development, where would you estimate your net worth being in just a six-year swing? Yeah, so I I evaluate my net worth on a quarterly basis. We're coming to the end of quarter four, and I have taken some big losses this quarter, but I should be right around $1.4, $1.5 million. So within six years, you went from 20000 to almost $1.6 million in your net worth. It's like, how many people would absolutely love to be there? Now, I'm going to throw something out there for you, Jaden. And that is, I would venture to say that your net worth could actually be way more than that. Because if you took your business and you were actually sell your business, I'm sure you would probably get a multiple and your net worth would be even higher. So That's some true. fun to think about. You could consider your business and the multiple you could get based on where it is currently. So I'm, I, I, don't I know. consider that the way that I, the way that I choose to evaluate my business is if I were to sell it and take me out of the picture, how much money could I generate? And I'm not to the point where I could step away from the business entirely. So really, if I step out of the business, it's really not worth anything. So yeah, I do generate a lot of income from it, but I'm not in a position where I could sell it until I fully replace myself. So yeah. you're right. Or, like With the income that I'm generating, it's probably worth a million and a half dollars in and of itself. Um, but I, I can't replace myself yet. So I'm still getting to that point. Yeah. And so that would bring you to over $3 million net worth. And yeah, you're right. And this is for a lot of people out there who think about creating businesses and get into real estate, it sounds sexy. And there are times where it absolutely is, right? Like your deal where you made $300,000 plus, but they, what most people don't see is the challenges and the the pain that we have to go through when building a business. They don't see the the long hours at times or you know the late nights at times. And I think that fools a lot of people. And yeah. Yeah. if you were to find someone that wanted to be an active business owner like yourself, I think you would easily be able to step out and sell it and, and be able to run with that money. However, yeah, they just ahead. have to be a licensed professional engineer. That's the biggest caveat there. Yeah. <laughs> your, your pool kind of shrinks there, yes, right? it does. but, yeah. but just like, uh, just like they say in dumb and dumber that you're saying there's a chance. So. There's a chance. That's right. <laughs> I love awesome, it. man. So tell us, so you got some other businesses. What, a, what business did you say it was? Pretty so I, I own a couple other businesses. I own a small construction company. We only do projects for ourselves. I'm a licensed general contractor, which was an easy thing to get in the state of Utah as a professional engineer and my background in construction. Um, I also own an engineering firm. Uh, we have five employees in my engineering firm. Um, we do. We just had our biggest month ever, crossed $100,000 gross for the month, which was awesome. Um, Great job, man. Awesome. Yeah. And then yes. I have... I have some other small ventures that I've, I own, I put money in and they have not yet been fruitful. So I'm not really excited to talk about those ones, but, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you know what, that's, I love that you have the courage to bring that up because again, people look at, you know, a lot of the YouTube interviews that we'll do, I do and others that they do and they sit back and they're oh, yeah. like, wow, they're worth, you know, millions and their business is doing a hundred grand, 200 grand in a month. Like, and they sit back and they say, what am I doing wrong? Right. And they might not say that out loud, but in their minds, they're like, what am I not doing that they're doing better than me? And I want people to know that as an entrepreneur, I look at entrepreneurship like baseball. The ones that are in the Hall of Fame, they strike out 70% of the time. <laughs> right. And so they Absolutely. have 70% of their time is failure. As yeah. an entrepreneur, I like to think it's probably actually more, but like it's like baseball. You, if you can hit 300, you're winning. And so you're, get, you're winning, 
but you also have some strikeouts that I know you're looking to turn around and, and time can probably help with that. But yeah. it's like, just share with the audience, like from your experience on your journey of entrepreneurship, like what were some of your failures and how did you overcome them? And I, and how are you handling the ones you're currently in? Yeah, well, I, I mean, let's back up a little bit. I went to college. I spent a ton of money on getting my master's degree. Yes, I had some scholarships. Yes, I had some help. But the opportunity cost, I went to school in 2009 and I had tunnel vision on during the greatest real estate boom of our time. You know, <laughs> I could have been making millions and millions of dollars more than what I'm currently worth if I had just shifted my vision from, hey, let's get this engineering degree to, hey, let's go buy real estate assets. If, and it took me a while to really appreciate what um, what value my education had for me because I was I was a little bit bitter towards the system when I realized that I'm only making 40 grand a year as a structural engineer and I'm working 60 hours a week with two two weeks paid vacation. This is not what I signed up for. This is not a good lifestyle. And I was I was bitter about that for a while. And so education is one thing that I would I would harp on a little bit as as one of my losses. Um to go ahead. And how do you overcome? So how do you overcome some of those losses or failures? And even in the ones you're experiencing now, how do you deal with that? Because some people just end up quitting. How do you, what do you do? Yeah, I think it's about gratitude and recognizing the lessons that you've learned. Like I, I realized after I quit being a structural engineer to pursue real estate full-time that yes, I can make a lot of money in real estate, but the way that I was doing it um, was not putting food on my table every single month. So I actually started an engineering business after I quit engineering full-time to put food on my table every month. And I then began to realize how grateful I was that I did work for an additional three years to get my professional engineering license, that I did go to school for five, six years to get a master's in structural engineering. Like there is value there. Um, and yeah, I've studied, I've read a lot of books. I've studied a lot of podcasts. I've listened to lots of people. Um, and there's so much value in education. That being said, I'm like, by nature, I'm frugal. I, I don't like to spend a ton of money on education. So when I, like I talked about looking at buying 40 unit apartment complex or larger, we went out to Ohio and said, this is the market we want to be in. We can buy a unit for $7,000. Let's do it. And so we went under contract on 55 units in Ohio. And six months later, we had $50,000 deposit that we put down on it. I really didn't know what I was doing getting into a new market. Uh, there was a shooting on the property. Our earnest money was non-refundable at that point. And our lender backed out the week before we were supposed to close. And I was like, SOL, there's, there goes my 50 grand. And I ended, we ended up hiring a lawyer, suing the sellers because they didn't disclose the shootings, the violent crimes and everything that were involved during the time we were under contract. But I, I think I lost like $35,000 on that one venture. And that's, that's, that hurts. But I had to recognize and realize that if I would have paid my buddy the $10,000 he was asking to teach me how to buy multifamily properties out of state, I wouldn't have lost that $35,000. And so there are losses. There are opportunities where I think, yeah, I could have done that better. Um, but it's it's a fine line between striking that balance between free online resources or whatever you can find that's going to be cheap education and actually valuable monetary education that's going to pay you back in the real world. Yeah, it's such that's such a good point because I believe all the information is out there, right? You just got to go find it and that's going to cost you time. However, you could go to someone who's reputable and pay a lot of money, right? 10, 50 grand, sometimes 100 grand to learn to fold time for you, but you're going to give up money. So you're going to give up time or you're going to give up money. And if you right. don't have money, you need to be able to find out where are the resources that are free that I can be able to start understanding, getting my feet wet, getting in there. Um, but I, I personally believe in investing. I've spent probably almost $400,000 over the last decade in myself, um, from personal development to real estate and passive income. And so I'm always investing in masterminds because look, yeah. they say your net worth is in direct proportion to your network. And so I love to help people understand that you got to be out there networking, connecting with people, getting in high level groups because they play life at a higher level and that causes you to raise your standards. So, 100%. Um, but, or you're going to, you're going to jump in kind of like you, right? You could have yeah. paid 10 grand and saved yourself all that time and pain. 
but you you paid thirty five grand for that education, right? So I you're going to pay some way or another. <laughs> That's right. You're going to pay one way yeah. or another. I rather fold time and get it done the right way. So I'm sure as you move forward, and I know, you know, we've worked in some masterminds together and you invested in yourself in that. And that's why you're, you know, you're continuing to, to move forward. So Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. Awesome. So before we wrap up, I want to ask a, f- a few different questions for you, just off the cuff, whatever comes to mind. Um, for, if you had to go back to 2015 and start all over what yeah. would you do differently if anything um i would buy everything that i possibly could make sense at all <laughs> um i mean hindsight's 2020 it's tough to say otherwise um but there is so much opportunity out there it's not about waiting to buy real estate it's about buying real estate and waiting um and i think even today, we're in a time when the markets, there's so much opportunity around us. There's so many opportunities to get seller financing deals, zero money out of pocket. Like those are the deals that I do and I love. Like I don't put any of my own money in real estate deals. My investment, like my, my invested capital goes into other investments because other people are paying for my real estate investments. Um, but just buy everything that I could. Absolutely. Nice. And if you had to go back and start all over and buy everything, who would you choose to learn from? Like, is there someone that you you really feel like has helped you catapult your business or uh, your education? Uh, Ken McElroy is one of the people that I truly admire. He's one of the smartest people in real estate that I know. Um, he's one of the rich dad advisors from Robert Kiyosaki. I, I would follow Ken McElroy anywhere he goes. <laughs> That's so, awesome. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. One of uh one of my business partners gets mentored by him. So awesome. that's really impressive. So um okay. Your favorite book of all time. Let's not use Rich Dad Poor Dad. We talked about that outside of Rich Dad Poor Dad. What's outside your favorite of real book of all estate time? or outside of yeah. I mean I've, let's I could... do one real estate book and one personal development or one educational book. All right. Only because <clears> I <throat> I've got Ooh, he's got them right there. I've got two of my favorite books right here. Uh, this one is called The Wealthy God Gardener by John Seforic. I love this book because it takes so many of all the great real estate or self-help books and just kind of lumps it into one in an easy to read format. But this is a great refresher. I try to read this thing every single year because it teaches me so much about all the other books out there. It talks about habits, talks about assets, liabilities, talks about investing your money. So I highly recommend The Wealthy Gardener. And then as far as not real estate, I would recommend anybody go read The Creature from Jekyll Island. This is a hefty read. It's a 24-hour it's a audible listen. Um, this one is extremely impactful. It has changed the way that I view money, our monetary system, and the world. And it has helped me understand uh, the difference between a liability and an asset on a deeper level. Um, and real estate is one of the best hedges against the injustices that are going on in our monetary system today. And this is this is a book that'll teach you all about it. So those are my two favorite books right now. That's awesome. We'll put those in the show notes also. If you had one piece of advice that you could give to the audience, what would it be? It never hurts to ask. Um there, like I had a one of my mentors that I recently uh, hired. He says the biggest mistake people make in real estate is giving people money without asking for it back, and that was profound to me because I'm in a frame of time when I'm raising capital for a lot of my different ventures. We're doing more syndications, we're doing more private money, and you have to recognize that when you give people money, they just need a place to put it, and so it's important that you ask for it back. But more importantly, you have to ask for the things that you want and don't be afraid to to ask because the worst they're going to say is no. That's one reason that I like to submit multiple offers when I'm talking with potential sellers. It's one reason that I like to, to put other people's money to work. It's one reason that I really like seller financing because it gives people higher valuations, it gives people uh, interest on their capital, it gives people all kinds of opportunities that helps them put more money in their pocket in the long run. And so don't be afraid to ask. That's awesome. That's so cool. 
If people want to reach out to you, connect with you, maybe be part of one of your deals if they, they're qualified, how can people get in touch with you? Yeah, I recommend people uh, reach out to me on social media. My Instagram and Twitter handles are at Jaden Olson 23. Uh, or you can email me directly at Jaden at ballparkprops.com. Awesome. We'll make sure that we get that out and we'll flash it across the screen for everyone so that they can be able to uh, be able to reach out to you. So, well, Jaden, I appreciate your time. You crushed it. I love to hear kind of the challenges and the success all mixed together because one thing I, I do not like, and it happens all the time on social media, is everyone puts out their highlight reel. And no one, yeah. me and my wife, we always like to say, we also like to keep it real. So thank you for keeping it real today and not just saying, hey, look at me, how much I make and my net worth. It's like, hey, here's where I'm at. And you did it beautifully talking about, you know, I've had some failures. And so I think that allows people to see that we're not, people who are successful are not superhuman. They're just like you. They make mistakes, but they also focus on their wins and how they can win moving forward. So that's, that's how Thanks, I see yeah. you today. So thanks a lot. It. I appreciate it. Guys, if you liked this interview, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Also subscribe, hit that notification button and comment below. What's one of the greatest nuggets you took away from Jaden today? Would love to hear what you took away because everyone has a different distinction. So with that, Jaden, thank you, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. And again, my name is Joe Moffitt with Master Life by Design for the Millionaire Series. And appreciate you tuning in. Have a good one. See ya. Thanks, Joe. See ya.